Hello and welcome to Cooking the Books with me, Jilly Smith, for a special series celebrating the André Simon Awards 2021. Founded in 1978 to recognise the achievements of food and drink writers, they're the longest running awards of their kind. Previous winners have included Elizabeth David and Rosemary Hume, Michelle Rue, Hugh Fernley Whittingstall, Nigel Slater, Rick Stein, Jamie Oliver, Rachel Roddy, Diana Henry. You'll know all those names. And each week until the awards themselves are announced on March the 8th, we're celebrating the authors shortlisted for the prestigious Food Book Award, with an introduction each week by this year's food assessor, Yemisi Arabisan. But to kick off the series, we're with two of the trustees today who've read hundreds of submissions to come up with that final shortlist. Xanthi Clay is a columnist and food writer with over 20 years of experience at The Telegraph. And Sarah Jane Evans, MW, is an award-winning wine writer, critic and journalist. I asked Sarah Jane to tell us about André Simon, one of the most legendary men in wine, and why there should be a food and drink award in his memory. André Simon was the archetypal gastronome. He appreciated the uh, finest foods and wines, and so it was very natural after his death that the trustees of the André Simon should create a memorial fund which celebrated the very best in wine, drinks and food books that should be published every year. Now, you and Xanthi are both trustees and part of your job is to whittle through hundreds of books on food and drink to find the best of the year. What are you looking for in an André Simon winner? What makes this gong stand out from the others? One of the things that we look for as trustees is books that will really stand the test of time. It's the question, will you still be referring to this book, enjoying this book in 10 years' time? And there have been, if you look through the list of the food books, some stupendous authors whose books still count. First year, 1978, the Jane Grigson vegetable book, something which is still super relevant today, super delicious. Equally, uh, if you look back through the list, well, Jane's fruit book, Jane Grigson's fruit book came, and then we had Yan Kit So, who in 1984 wrote a really, really important book on Chinese food. Um, <coughs> Henrietta Green did a survey of British food finds, which in its time was quite original. Uh, we had books by Jill Norman, Arabella Boxer, Sri Owen. That rice book in 1993 has really never been bettered. And Rick Stein, uh, Taste of the Sea appeared, Claudia Roden, uh, Ken Hom. It's been a real delight to be one of the trustees of the ward and, and have a chance to recognise the real excellence in food writing and wine writing and drinks writing. Yeah, it's not it's not just food books, as we've said, although this short list series will just be the food books because that's what Cooking the Books is all about. But tell us about the books on the drinks short list. I'm very excited by the drinks books this year. Uh, we've got obviously a range of wine books uh, from Burgundy, California, Portugal, a very um, modern look at um, new trends in winemaking, a guide to travel to South America, an uh, illustrated book on Santorini, a uh, uh, long overdue book on the, the wines of the Rhone, um, a whole range of things. But we've also got a great read on cider country uh, and we've got a compendious but super useful weighty companion to spirits and cocktails uh, and we've got uh, not forgetting a completely revised version of Jamie Good's book now and a third edition on wine science uh, so it's very very hard for us to choose just who's going to be the winner. Now you say that you're looking for books that stand the test of time but what trends have you seen in the submissions this year? Um, vegan eating, clean eating, it continues to be a very strong trend. But there's another theme which is undoubtedly a reflection of our lives in these last um, year, two years of uh, being cut off at home um, because of COVID. People have become very reflective. A number of, of authors have written us books about family cooking, about um, doing easy cooking for ones uh, uh, without too much complication. It, the whole style of um, communicating, writing about food has become much more approachable. I think this this, uh, la this year particularly doesn't seem quite so, uh, how can I say, chefy. Uh, there aren't so many books which have been, uh, are very complicated to cook. This is really a um, uh, time and with the Scandinavian word higa, we've definitely been looking for comfort and uh, there have been some lovely reflections of that. Um Xanthi, let's go through to the shortlist. 
Um, a lot of uh, Cooking the Wits listeners will already have heard nine out of the 15 on the long list. Um, let's go through and, and deliver the short list. Um, now, Ruth Nyman, Free K, Wild Wheat and Ancient Grains was on Cooking the Books only last week, actually. So uh, listeners will already know about that. What is it for you, do you think, that made it to the short list? I love books like this that take what's a fairly narrow subject and really go into it in depth and give you something that becomes a really important piece of research and resource um, to to know more and to understand more and to learn more. Um, And it's a fantastic book, really, really breaking down the significance and the science of grains. Yeah. And telling a story of what is actually bizarrely becoming a bit of a fad, biblical cuisine, something that looks into the oldest book in the world um, and finds something really interesting to say about food. Completely. Also, one of the oldest food stuffs in the world is pasta, of course. And Rachel Roddy's and A to Z of pasta is so much more than pasta recipes. It's a it's a history book, isn't it? It is. It's great. And it's also written in Rachel's extraordinary lyrical writing style. And one of the things that I love about this book is simply the way that she writes that makes you look at ingredients in a different way or or really feel a recipe. Yeah, it's a beautiful, wonderful read. As is Dee Ritali's Baking with Fortitude. The thing I love about Dee is that she has real heft in her subject, doesn't she? She comes from a tradition. She brings her baking skills from her grandmother's kitchen Mm -hmm. in Northern Ireland. And what, what was it for you that brought this one to the shortlist? It's full of things that I want to bake. It's got a um, a wonderful practicality mm. to it. Um, it really, it's very empowering because it's got so much information to actually help you not just bake her recipes, but really sort of move on and bake your own. Um, and, you know, from things like the olive oil base mix to the guides to fermentation to the it's um it's a beautiful book yeah and of course she she's the real deal she comes with a real pedigree that's what i love about her pedigree and story now herb haven't even started reading it yet um mark diacono who won in 2014 for his year at otter farm tell me about this one. Oh, this is a terrific book um and it's um it's got fantastic recipes mark's an amazing cook um and it uses lots of herbs that we aren't really sort of first rank and so we forget about them um and some of them are sort of really wonderfully simple like just taking a piece of cheese and wrapping it in lovage leaves and storing it in the fridge and then the cheese becomes imbued with the sense of lovage um what wonderful things like that he's also not going to try and make things into something they're not so he's absolutely straight about lemon balm he says no there's nothing you can do with it. Um, and I'm not sure I agree with him, but I love him for saying that. He's not going to jump through some sort of hoops because the publisher tells him he's got to have something for yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that reminds me a lot of someone like Jane Grigson, who would just say, you know, no, mar- marrows, they're rubbish. Um, and I like, I like that. I, like, I, I think we need a bit more opinion in our books and personality. Yes, bit of strength. Um, Mandy Yin, Sambal Shiok, I haven't got this one either yet, um, but I'll be interviewing both Mark and Mandy um, in in the weeks coming up um, as part of this special series for Andre Simon. Um, tell me about the book from your point of view. What makes it a shortlister? It feels really authoritative. Um, you know, the recipes don't hold back. You know, that some of them are quite long. They're going to, you know, take a bit of time to put together but they feel they feel right you know I don't feel that I'm being sold some sort of dumbed down version um you know she makes a proper chicken stock she for her high knees chicken rice she you know she goes into all the different separate parts of the dish um and yet it's a friendly voice you feel you can you can do this even if it you know you might have to set aside a 
an afternoon. Yeah. Um, and there's wonderful stories about her childhood and her grandparents and um, being introduced to different ingredients at the markets. And yeah. um, it's, it's just a lovely, evocative book and full of colour and delicious food. Yeah, wonderful. Which could be said for Ripe Figs by Yasmin Khan as well. The wonderful ability she has to take us to places. We can virtually smell the food uh, on the pages. Is that what you found from Ripe Figs? I did. Again, it's another beautiful book to look at um, and, uh, and, and just incredibly evocative. But she's, she's just fascinated in the relationship between recipes and people. Mm. That's what I love to read about her. What, what do you think she adds to the canon? There's something of Claudia Rodin about her. Mm. She has this incredible breadth of knowledge that really means that she can look at another cuisine in an intelligent way and shine a light on it. Yeah. And then, of course, to today's episode, um, Eating to Extinction uh, by Dan Saladino. Now, he was on um, the show sometime last year and was one of my top five books of the year. It is a sweeping story of our relationship with food. Uh, it's about the loss of diversity and its impact on everything, really, on humankind and the planet. And it is woven through with wonderful tales of resilience and a know-how of people, of, of food heroes and farmers and growers who, who really do seem to hold the key to our future. It is about endangered foods. Um, that feels terribly now to me. I wonder whether this will still be around in 10 years and whether it will still be relevant. I mean, I hope not <laughs> for the sake of the planet. I take your point. I think there is always um, a question mark over books like Eating to Extinction, which in a sense are capturing a moment. Um, they're talking about what's happening now, you know, the world's rarest foods and why we need to save them. What I think about Dan's book is that it does have longevity because he's worked in so much history and like some of the best food books, it really isn't just about food. It's told through the vector of food, but there's so much more in the story of our, of our planet, yeah. uh, which is woven in through all of these, these essays. And actually, I think that, uh, I hope we can save these foods from extinction. But I think quite a lot of them are going to remain quite niche. <laughs> I think they will still be ones that we will want to read about and learn more about. Well, absolutely. But I suppose that the big question is, is our connection with food, isn't it? Let's hope that in 10 years time we'll have a much better connection with food um, and that we'll understand its relationship with, with the planet that we need to save. Santhi, thank you so much. We're going to go over now to Dan Saladino and hear that wonderful episode of Cooking the Books that came out last year, uh, where he goes into lots and lots of detail about his four food moments. Thank you very much indeed for taking us through the shortlist. Thank you, Julie. Now to the first of the books on the André Simon shortlist. Radio 4's food programme presenter Dan Saladino, whose book Eating to Extinction was one of my top five in 2021. When I interviewed him last autumn for Cooking the Books, he told me the difference a book can make in telling one of the most important stories in the world. The book gave me the opportunity to stop and think, which I hadn't done on the food programme sufficiently, to join the dots between these many different stories from different parts of the world and actually understand the history of how diversity came into existence so how our food over thousands if not millions of years became so extraordinarily diverse around the world and then at the same time in uh, a relatively recent uh, period and a, a very short period how that diversity was lost journalism is all about people isn't it individual stories and you paint wonderful pictures of people and tribes amazing things that are happening in very very far-flung places around the world but the story that you're telling the grand narrative is not so nice mm. it's basically about industrialization and it's about progress mm. it is averting famine the green revolution and mm. that was all about feeding the masses after mass starvation in in america in the 1930s onwards um the answer was homogenization of crops 
mm-hmm. by the 1950s. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Earl Butt said, get big or get mm-hmm. out. And that was the big change in farming. We talk about it a lot on, on Cooking the Books. That led to a laziness amongst people. I mean, you know, you said that imagination is is what what makes humans human and it's food that inspires that imagination if mm. you look at that the way we have developed as homo sapiens it yeah. is about our relationship with food mm. and that has been completely dumbed down mm. to the point where we are careering towards i think you know possibly the end of empire the end yeah. of the world as we know it mm. because of what we've been doing to our imaginations yeah. and to our food yeah is that what you one of the big messages yeah um you're right that the the book is very much about the decline of diversity and which is why we have endangered foods and the fact that we have reduced so much of this extraordinary diversity to um just a handful of crops so for example you know we as as humans have domesticated in other words taken from the wild and turned into um uh, cultivated uh, plants and, and animals um, well 6,000 different uh, plant species and and around more than 7,000 catalogued animal breeds we now consume mostly from nine crops and the big three so wheat rice and maize provide around half of, of, of the world's calories so um, yeah so I think that dramatic decline in diversity was an important story um, that, I, that I felt needed to be told. But it, what I'm trying to do in the book is go on the ground and explore these stories. And as you've mentioned, the device is to take a specific food, meet people, go to a particular location, which I feel, as you said, it in terms of journalism, that gives me something to say and report back to the, in this case, the reader. Um and paint a picture and, and and paint pictures to, and and I really wanted this to be accessible and not academic and I wanted it to be engaging and if possible make it gripping it's almost like the history of humans and food so we go from hunter gatherers we go into cereals so the very first farmers in the fertile crescent so there's that structure to the book and then there's another one which goes from you know cereals and then it ends up in sweet as well so it's almost like a a, a menu um and, and what i wanted to do was uh yeah that the imagination or the innovation and ingenuity of human beings to answer that question of what, what do we eat today or how, how can we survive and all these different solutions around the world of you know domesticating different types of grass so you know in in china it was rice in in the fertile crescent um you know uh, southeastern turkey it was wheat and in in mexico in southern mexico it was it was maize and all these incredible human solutions to how to survive so i wanted to capture that 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 you know more that cultural story and that story of societies and the first cities and that more anthropological treatment of food and that then at the same time that alarm bell ringing that in the from the 19th into the 20th um, and particularly after the second world war our ability to control nature and to produce more and more calories um, with the application of science and trade to really narrow that diversity down um, we thought that was good and it and it averted famines and it, it created, as I mentioned, a lot of calories. However, we now fast forward into the 21st century. We're in a situation where we are seeing the consequences of that. So issues of um, climate change, of, of water depletion, uh, soil degradation or, uh, and, and poor nutrition as well. The optimistic bit is that we now recognise that that simplicity or that reductionist approach to food production is problematic and uh, highly risky. It lacks resilience. And so the reason I'm optimistic is that at COP26, and you and I are having this conversation very close to COP, we've also just in the last um, few weeks uh, of, of this conversation also seen the first ever UN Food Systems Summit. And the the first bit is the systems approach to looking at food. This is now a conversation about biodiversity, about diversity, about the complexity of of, um, of food systems and agricultural systems. That wasn't happening 
in in Paris, for example, yeah. when um, you know we were talking about setting targets um, to, to to cope with uh, climate change, food is very much now on the agenda, and diversity and biodiversity, which is at the heart of my book, is very much part of the conversation. So there's a reason for optimism. Let's go back to where it all started for you, your first food moment, Sicily, where you mm. come from, where your father <laughs> comes from. Yeah. So I, my my father. Uh, Liborio Saladino, Bobo Saladino is um, Sicilian. My mum, uh, Elaine, is um, English. And uh, so I, I, uh, <laughs> I had these parallel lives in a way and parallel food lives because uh, I, I grew up in Bristol. My, my dad always worked with food, um, worked in restaurants. And uh, so I, in the 70s in the UK, um, I was very much a child of that era when it when it comes to food. So, um, you know, all all the all the f- um, processed foods that were really um, coming into their own in the se- 1970s. You know, they were part of. Uh, I had a mum who worked. You know, so um, you know we had Sunday roasts and we probably ate more Italian food than most families. But I I and I describe this in the book as well that. My summer holidays were spent sometimes and I would travel on my own to Ribera, the village in the southwest where my father came from. Um, and I would stay with my nonna in um, in Via Coletti, which is the name of the, the road. Um, and it was like that scene in The Wizard of Oz where Dorothy leaves behind this black and white world and then wakes up in this... MGM Technicolor world of um, and in the case of Sicily it was it was color it was noisy you know it was people were arguing sitting around tables the food I was barely recognizable I mean a lot of it I didn't even know what it was until um, you know it was explained to me that that's that's octopus or that's squid or you know um, and all these different uh, you know tomatoes tasted different and uh, markets were a, a, a real assault on the senses so I I grew up with that influence, but the way that then becomes part of my professional um, food story of of, uh, the food program. When I joined the team in 2007, I was I really lucked out in that I was asked, was there a story I was interested in? It was February. So I said, well, I do know that it's the um, citrus harvest season in in Sicily. And I think, you know, I, I think it'd be fascinating to go and record this um, process in the Mediterranean, you know, of, of going into citrus groves and watching the, the you know, the, the citrus harvest. And um, very luckily, you know, I, I was able to travel. Um, but and I thought I was going to make this celebratory program. Um, but actually, I arrived and there were farmers, quite elderly farmers, who had subsidised their citrus groves with their pensions, who were saying that it was the last harvest. And next year they were going to leave the oranges on the trees because cheaper citrus uh, being grown in Spain and North Africa. Um, that's what the Italian supermarkets were now buying and they were going out of business. That was my introduction to the Ark of Taste, the catalogue of slow food, because I then went, <laughs> well, after spending a day in the citrus groves, I went to this meal organised by um, producers and farmers and slow food to try and raise the profile and tell the story of Sicily's blood oranges grown around Etna to try and make people aware that, you know, it was culture, it was history, it was about landscape because of the beauty of the citrus groves that, that around that part of Sicily. And also it was economy, you know, that these, these um, citrus groves for, for many, many years had enabled farmers to send their children to, um, to university, but, but no more. So at this meal, there were five courses. Each course had the blood orange as an ingredient. And I sat next to somebody who said, well, these blood oranges are now in the Ark of Taste. And I said, well, Ark of what? You know, what, what does that mean? And he said, well, it's a catalogue. And then went into this story that it was um, a, a catalogue of endangered foods. You know, we are used to the idea of endangered animals and plants. This was a catalogue of thousands of endangered foods and drinks and cheeses and breeds all over the world. And and it, it, that really struck home and I, th- I thought I want to learn more. And over the next decade and more, I tried to collect as many of those endangered stories as possible. But it does all start in Sicily. Um, not only, the, you know, the, my introduction to the Ark of Taste, but also it was that's the place where I first walked onto a farm. That's the place where I heard people 
telling stories, whether true or false, you know, whether they were made up stories or not. People love shouting and arguing about food. And so I don't know whether that's why I love telling food stories today, but it, so much of the book and my food story starts in Sicily. Yeah, it's so interesting. So many of the stories of the people I speak to about those food uh, epiphanies, it starts with rupture. It's, you know, people who just kind of seem to just go along a path and, you know, grow up and don't really have that wake up moment. They don't see it. So that, those two very parallel stories are fascinating. And one of the other stories in your second food moment is another story you did for the food programme, isn't it? The Hatsa tribe. Mm, yeah. So this um, was triggered by a conversation with Professor Tim Spector, who... Um, it, it, as we now know, is one of the great experts on um, the gut microbiome because he, as an ep epidemiologist, had um, been working for years on the twin study. So he was trying to figure out why is it that one twin might be obese or have type 2 diabetes and another twin um, was not. And it, they, they are genetically identi identical. So how would you explain that? And then this is why he started to investigate the fact that the community of trillions and trillions of microbes in our guts could have um, something uh, to, could explain that because, um, you know, take two genetically identical twins, their gut microbiomes will be different. So his idea was, well, let's go to East Africa, to Tanzania, and actually, as you do, and meet, meet some hunter-gatherers um, who are modern human beings, but living... Um, our most ancient of life stars uh, as hunter-gatherers. So in other words, they their diets, um, it's not a proxy for prehistoric man and woman, but actually they are the, clo they are the closest we can get to what our ancestors survived on for, for thousands, if not millions of years of our evolution. And they have a potential menu of, of 800 different plant and animal species as well. So, the, again, the key word here is diversity. They have an extremely diverse diet, which Tim Spector's theory was, well, that should mean that they have a more diverse um, gut microbiome and that therefore that they will not suffer from the same kind of diet-related illnesses which we do. So Tim went over, studied the Hadza, became a Hadza himself in a way because, you know, he... he um, enjoyed the, the diet of, um, you know, that the Hadza were having, you know, these tubers and berries and and honey as well. And actually the the conclusion was that when he came back and did a test, he did find that he did have a more diverse gut microbiome by him even after just one week yeah. with the Hadza. So I, I wanted to take that story um, from radio and into the book, not not for the mi the microbiome story, but actually... Because in the book, I did want to go back through our history and also this idea that there are skills and there was knowledge um, that still exists just that could disappear in our lifetimes. And this was the, the story that made it into the book is the one in which the Hadza are able to have a conversation with birds. They whistle. It attracts um, the honey guide bird which is a scientific name, indicator, indicator, which is a clue because the the bird then leads the Hadza to bees' nests, which would take the, the Hadza hunters hours to find on their own. Um, the Hadza go up, smoke out, smoke the nests, get the honey, and then leave something behind for the birds that then avoid the risk of being stung. So this mutual interest um and this relationship that we don't quite know how it evolved but it must have evolved over um uh, again hundreds of thousands of years if not um going back to our um uh, first use of fire um and also is part of this idea that it was it was honey that made us human not not meat that's a, an interesting theory that i also touch on in the book so for me that was such a, a, a food moment because it was my direct, it was it was a really direct link to uh, you know this this huge story of yeah. human beings, yeah. Af East Africa, our evolution, these birds, this conversation, honey. You, you could crunch into the honey, biting away on some of the bees that were trapped in the honey, but also the the the, the bees larvae as well. So 
you know, this idea of carbohydrate and the sugars, but also protein as well. Mm. Um, so, it, yeah. it made me cry. I mean, oh. it's one of the very first stories in the book and it is beautifully written for a start. I absolutely felt I was in the bush witnessing this extraordinary moment. And of course, this is modern day. They are modern human beings and they mm. haven't changed their diet for many. They've sorted it. They've nailed life, haven't they? Yeah. But of course, then what happens? is that their land is being taken. So the outside world, as you, as you say, it's kind of, it, it's now encroaching on the Hadza. There are, I mean, there are a thousand Hadza and just 200 of them still live as hunter-gatherers practicing no form of agriculture. Um, but there are other tribes now moving into the, to the Hadza land and growing crops because there's, the water's run out where they um, used to be farming. And also, uh, you know, I, I described this image at the end of that chapter of this brick hut, um, quite close enough for the Hadza to reach, where you walk in and there's a light bulb hanging from a um, a wire from the the metal roof. And then you're surrounded by these um, fizzy soft drinks from from the West and biscuits and, you know, all cook, sweet cookies. And, and in, a, in a sense, that was... Uh, you know, look, standing there thinking, well, th it is likely that in our lifetimes, something that has existed for an incomprehensible amount of time could disappear. And that for me was such a powerful thing to sense that, um, you know, 90% of all humans that have ever lived have lived as hunter gatherers. And um, it's our most successful lifestyle to date. Yeah. Without question, you know, it could could be lost completely, which I think is, yeah, I mean, it's just mind blowing. Yeah. And, mm. and you scary. Know, it is scary. Mm. And I suppose that's where I was feeling. The reason I felt teary was because I felt very pessimistic. It felt like, you know, King Canute, you know, how do you stem mm. the tide of progress and industrialization, which is all about money? The issue with the Hadza tribe is planting of crops that are a monoculture. Mm. Now, this is one of the big issues, isn't it? Mm. Um, it leads into your third food moment, mm. uh, which takes us to Eastern Turkey. Eastern Turkey, yeah. Um, yeah, and you're right. Uh, th this is a story of monocultures of, of crops. But also, I, I, I think, just thinking about this now as you're saying it, it's almost like the monoculture... Of, of the human experience of that, you know, homogenization process. So, yeah, I, I wanted these big moments in human history when it comes to food. So I did want that hunter gatherer story and the, you know, the conversation with the honey guide and and honey. But I also wanted that idea of twelve thousand years ago, the very first farmers, the agriculturalists in the Fertile Crescent, which again is just one of those key moments in in our history and so i tried to get in, in on my travels and this was um travel specifically for the book so I, this wasn't for the food program I, I wanted to get as close to the fertile crescent as i could which is the fertile crescent is that um place where uh, archaeobotanists um know a, quite a lot about how um groups of humans started to domesticate um wheat uh barley um uh, lentils as well um, and so I, I traveled to uh, a village in eastern Anatolia and um, you know if you cross over the border uh, you've got Georgia to the north you've got Iran and Iraq to the south east as well um, and so th this is this is this for me was you know the birthplace of agriculture mm -hmm. and I found Emma wheat growing uh, being grown by farmers there now Emma um, before the arrival of bread wheat, uh, which is not only the dominant wheat, but one of the most dominant crops in the world. Emma and iron corn were the first wild wheat to be domesticated. And Emma was the wheat that the people who built the pyramids uh, in Egypt would have been growing and, and um, baking and, and eating. Um, and also the people who built Stonehenge as well. They, Emma was the most successful wheat for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, and it disappeared. But one of the places it survived was in a tiny village in, in um, eastern Turkey. So I went there. And, I, and the key idea here, and this is one of the big ideas in the book, is that the reason why these farmers kept growing it was, two, was twofold. One is 
most other types of wheat will not grow in this kind of damp, cold, quite mountainous, high altitude village. So this Emma wheat has so wonderfully adapted to those conditions and it's you know it's been planted generation after generation of farmer farmers have planted the seeds and it's it's kind of evolved to 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 deal with those conditions and um so if you took a modern bread wheat and planted it in the village it would probably be over you know overwhelmed by fungal diseases and that's that for me is the kind of really important thing to understand in the book that these aren't just quaint traditions and these farmers do love the look of the wheat in their fields they do love the taste of the wheat when it's cooked however the really important thing is that that adapted crop grows with very little um or very few inputs and um it, you can you if it, once it's gone you cannot recreate that wheat uh f- farmers in the uk today have um a recommended list of around 10 modern varieties of of bread wheat that have been chosen by the industrial milling experts and and also some scientists as well in svalbard the the seed uh, vault in the arctic circle which is the, the storage place for a million seeds which i love the idea of that like, <laughs> buried it, it is it? yeah and it looks like that as well <laughs> this kind of this tunnel going into the ice um that is the you know the, the the safe place for the world's um agricultural history and a million seeds there are more than 200,000 wheat samples alone in Svalbard, which shows what diversity could exist. Yeah. But we've narrowed it down again. And with that, you lose resilience because the crop breeders are having to create modern wheat more quickly to try and keep up or outpace the diseases. And yet out there are these seeds and these wheats. And, you know, you, you can apply this to all the other crops. And many of them are told in the book that might have drought resistance disease resistance you know they can they some of them can deal with flooding and and all these traits that our ancestors identified and and saved and valued yeah. and we thought that with science we could fix everything yeah. with inputs and new technology but we can't because yeah. nature is far more complex and we can't keep um as i mentioned this high energy high input system we need to look at these other adapted crops to see what traits they might have for our future. We cannot afford to lose a single one. Uh, and, and each of the chapters has a hero or heroes who are out there saving these crops. And in eastern Turkey, there was a farmer called Naz, Nazdet who was... Uh, he, he had encouraged his neighbours to start to grow this old traditional wheat again because many of them had been tempted to grow the modern wheat but Nasdaq was trying to get them to start to grow this um, delicious wheat and there were chefs in Istanbul who were um, preparing dishes because they'd fallen in love with the flavours of this Emma as well and there was um, uh, also a miller called Erdem he was the last remaining miller who was prepared to do the work to to um, yeah mill this emma wheat because it's it's a hulled grain so it it need, you know you need to process it three times uh three sets of s- different stones er- erdem was, again was you know he could have had an easier life by uh milling other types of wheat but he said that there is no other wheat that that i can smell um f- the the aromas coming from the village when people use this wheat as well so yeah, it and without Erdem and without Nasdaq, then these these foods would disappear. Yeah, absolutely. These people are the champions. They are the stewards of the land, and of course, that's what farming was. These people who really did understand. I remember mm. James Rebank saying to me that you know when his grandfather was talking about tractors, he said when man gets into that machine and he raises himself above the land, he loses that connection because mm. he doesn't see those tiny little details. You. Meet another one of these heroes in Georgia, mm. in your pursuit of natural wines. Now, you and I have had the same experience, like mine in Slovenia and you in Georgia. Tasting natural wines is rather an extraordinary process, isn't it? It is, yeah. So I um, was uh, lucky enough to know um, somebody who who had travelled through Georgia um, in meticulous fashion, um, Carla Capalbo, who had written a book about Georgian food and, and Georgian wine and I and I traveled there um, to, to make a radio program but 
the real hero who, or the person who really made such an impression on me was Ramaz, Ramaz uh, Nicoladzi, who is a, a winemaker, uh, who, who, you know, many generations of his family have been winemakers. And he lives in the uh, western, more hilly, mountainous part of Georgia, which is, explains why actually some of the traditions um, had survived there um, during the Soviet era when it was industrialized. Um, Ramaz um, and his family had kept making wine, and I, I you know, I, th I think um, uh, many many experts would agree that it's the birthplace of wine, and it has the um, greatest number of indigenous grape varieties as well, so more than five hundred. And Ramaz, um, again, this phrase I, I use in the book, and, and one that he's he also uses himself of zero compromise that. Um, again, he could have had a much easier life by, um, you know, taking a few shortcuts. But he, his his vineyard was like a wilderness, so um, and and full of nature and biodiversity and, and natural yeasts as well that were settling yeah. on the grapes. Yeah. He um, also uh, was committed to the quevery, so the, the again ancient terracotta um, vessels that are buried underground in which the um, not just the juice but also the the, the skins of the grapes um, and sometimes the whole bunch is put in and it, it ferments away um, and no, nothing else is added. Uh, it, this is why it's a natural wine. So, and uh, Ramaz was a hero because yeah, this, this idea that this zero compromise that it, he felt that he was part of a, a culture in which wine almost had this sacred status and it was almost as if you raise it like a child. So in other words, you don't make wine. You just allow the, the, the grape to become what it wants to become, which is which is wine. And uh, I had this incredible <laughs> evening with Ramaz and his, his, his wife created this wonderful meal of dumplings and, and breads and salads. And and out came bottle after bottle of these um some wines were recognizably white others were this glorious amber orange color and i think by the end of the evening that we'd got through about nine bottles but felt you know i felt felt really you know merry uh, what i didn't have in the morning was a hangover yeah. and there is something you know special about these wines um both in, in terms of the story the process the history uh, but they also make you feel good, I'm convinced. They do. Uh, they do. I mean, I wonder, I, I haven't, I, my experience was with Klinich wines in uh, Slovenia and uh, exactly the same in the home of the people who make it and have whose family have made it for a very long time, totally natural, eating the food from the land, from the pigs that wander around the vineyard, naturally fertilising everything. It, we were high as kites. I mean, we all were absolutely having the best time ever. Nobody had a hangover the next day. But I'm, we were all talking about it and we were convinced that we had really chanced upon something incredibly special. Yeah, and, and I think it's a less familiar story, but there are parallels with the Green Revolution as well in that when the science became available in the 1960s, for particularly, you know, for, I mean, France, understandably, was recovering from... The, the, you know the devastation of war and so therefore if there were processes that you could implement in the vineyard or uh, when you're when you're making wine then then why not modernize and um and use these these techniques but what that then creates is because of the success of creating more and more consistent wine that these these techniques well not only the techniques but also the grape varietals as well spread around the world and so this process of homogenization unfolds and backed up by wine consultants and, and wine critics as well. So more of the wine world becomes the same as well, which is why that's another story of um, positivity and, and one that gives you optimism. Because as we know, there is a, is a, a new generation and, and in some cases an old generation of winemakers who um, are... At, who are saving diversity, celebrating diversity, and there's been a real revival in experimentation with with less familiar grape varieties. When Jancis Robinson was um, doing her book on um, uh, grape varieties, I mean, it it was into the thousands, and then she she published the book, and then she's inundated with letters from um, uh, people saying, "Well, you missed this one out." So there was a huge amount of diversity out there that wasn't being recognized in the mainstream wine industry yeah. that we weren't having access to and i think that is changing yeah 
I mean, I'd love to, to find out if we can be optimistic. I know that you're optimistic and I would love you to persuade mm. me by mm -hmm. the end of this show that there are reasons to be optimistic. I can't imagine mm. what it would take. And I know that it only takes apparently 25% to get to that tipping point. How can you get 25% of a global population to, to understand what you're saying and mm. do something about it? You know, cheap food is, is so misunderstood that process, that system mm. is so hidden that there's a lot of work that has to be done. That's where my issue is. I, I don't disagree or I'm, I, sure I, 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 see, I see it as you see it, that, that I think the system has been extremely successful in producing this abundance of food. The optimistic bit is that we now recognise that that simplicity or that reductionist approach to food production is problematic and uh, highly risky. It lacks resilience. And so the reason I'm optimistic is that at COP26, and you and I are having this conversation very close to COP, we've also just, in the last um, few weeks uh, of, of this conversation, also seen the first ever UN Food Systems Summit. And the, the first bit is the systems approach to looking at food. This is now a conversation about biodiversity, about diversity, about the complexity of of, um, of food systems and agricultural systems that wasn't happening in in Paris for example yeah. when um, you know, we were talking about setting targets um, to, to to cope with uh, climate change food is very much now on the agenda and diversity and biodiversity which is at the heart of my book is very much part of the conversation so there's a reason for optimism and also that that people around the world have been attracted to these foods as well which is a again that's a completely different conversation it's a complicated one in terms of marketing and our predisposition to sugar salt and fats and, and all those other things but underpinning that that um process um are some decisions uh that were taken and you mentioned the green revolution i mean that was a concerted effort to to redesign the food system and it it, it succeeded and Norman Borlaug, one of the architects, you know, the botanist who actually came up with the dwarfed wheat that proved so successful it spread around the world, even he realised there was a time lim limit on the Green Revolution as a fix to immediate famine in Asia and, el and elsewhere. So I, I think that the fact that governments invested in that process through subsidies, and now that we are seeing the problems... Um, the green revolution, in a way, is is, an, is is another reason for optimism in that it shows that, that we can change Absolutely. the food system. Now, we are hooked on these foods and, in a, in a sense, global farming has become addicted to the subsidy systems that have made it possible because there wouldn't have been the abundance of cereals without that concerted effort by governments and huge, you know, trillions of dollars of investment globally to make, to make that happen. But again, it's just, I think... I'm optimistic about change because we, we know change has to happen. Mm. It, we cannot continue with a food system that is underpinned by fossil fuels, for example. Mm -hmm. we, we know that change has to happen. The question is, how, how do we make that change happen? And, and obviously, we are also worried about um, public health budgets, about type 2 diabetes and, and, and obesity. So again, another reason for a, a, a paradigm shift in the way we produce um, and, and consume food. So I think, um, I, and let me just add one last thing, because I'm just I'm in the middle of making a programme at the moment, which um, probably will, will have gone out by the time this podcast is published, about um, investor networks and asset managers and people who control trillions of, of dollars of, of our pension funds and other assets around the world. They are influencing the future of food because they are identifying risk in the system and they don't work in short-term electoral cycles. They are thinking about what is going to pay as a return in a decade or even perhaps even 20 years time. And so they are moving money around the food system now to areas of lower risk. And that means investing in companies producing healthier food, for example, or um, away from intensive livestock systems where there might be disease outbreaks. Again, I'm coming back at you yeah. with you know there are right. there, there well, are yeah, serious the reasons money, for yeah. Said, follow follow yeah. Follow the money yeah. and also follow the the need. We need 
to change. Now, and I'm not saying in the book that the endangered foods I'm listing, that they are the foods that will feed the world. What I'm saying is a better future food system is one in which these these foods do, are not at risk of disappearing and becoming extinct because they do provide clues to how our ancestors survived for thousands of years, which I don't think should be or, or can be dismissed. And they, they also are, um, you know, with the application of new science, they might show us how we can produce food in better harmony with nature. What about us, Dan? What about you and me here in the UK? You say, eat an endangered apple. Drink some natural wine that's produced around your area. Support the local producers. Eat locally and seasonally. Well, that's the big message. It has been for a long time. Mm. Is it enough? No. Um, I, I wish I could write a book that was the instruction manual to, to save diversity and, and take us into the future. And But, you know, I'm a storyteller. I'm not a farmer, a chef or an academic. I, I tell stories. And I think the most important thing, step one, is to know the story. Or, and know these stories. So how did we get here? Where, where does our food come from? How has it changed in a relatively short amount of time? Why does that matter? And I think knowledge is power. Um, there are things that we could be doing, and, and uh, you know, eat an endangered apple. Well, actually, it goes, it goes further than that, really, because, you know, there is um, common ground. There are community orchards. There's, there's Apple Day. Um, and again, on one level, this might sound quaint, but actually, th th these are this is a community endeavour where people all over the UK are coming together to save diversity, save orchards, save part of their landscape and to pass on these um, these fruits for uh, the next generation. Now, our Victorians in, in Britain could eat a different apple every day for four years and not repeat the same uh, experience. You know, they had that much apple diversity. We've lost that. But there are people out there trying to save it. And that's one thing that you can actually get involved in. We have a charity uh, in the Midlands, the um, uh, Heritage Seed Library, where from the, since the 1970s, people have deposited and withdrawn seeds to grow uh, vegetables again. That's a very uh, important um, process that's saved a lot of foods from becoming endangered. Uh, but also, I do think we should think like a Hadza. We should, the Hadza have continued to thrive in that part of the world for as long as they have because they've known the limits of the landscape that they live in and depend on. And I think that's just, that's just an idea that we all should appreciate, really, that there are limits um, to what uh, ecosystems and the environment can, can offer and there are boundaries that we shouldn't be crossing. And I, and I think that if we are, if we all became more aware of that and our diets were influenced by that, that would make a big difference. And, and then just finally, our health depends on diversity. So why not find diversity, celebrate it, eat it? Thanks for listening. And I'll be back next week with the next on the Andre Simon Awards shortlist, Rachel Roddy. You can also find me on Food FM, the online radio station and global podcast platform which aims to change the world through food. And do get in touch with me on social media. I'm at Cooking the Books with Jilly Smith on Instagram and at Jilly Smith on Twitter. Mm -hmm.